USDA and RCS shows up to 0.75 inches for 5% precipitation, 29 inch snow depth, December to January 2015-16. Utah's at reservoirs were only at 4 to 15% full through the cars as well. So they're watering the parking lot. But in the middle of the day, the hottest time of day, they're watering. It's not helpful. I'm going to try to be as clear as I can, although I am going to be talking about some things that are complex scientifically. And I entitled my talk, Flying Microbes, Atmospheric Highways, and the Role of Biology and Rainfall, in France's National Agricultural Research Institute in Avignon. In this short presentation, I'm going to talk about how some of the microorganisms that are commonly present on plants might have a role in rainfall that perhaps you had never heard about before. What are the factors that determine when, where, and how much it rains? First of all, the large scale circulation patterns of the atmosphere create the conditions that make rainfall possible. Ice nucleating particles catalyze freezing of cloud droplets to make drops that are heavy enough to fall as rain. How do bacteria such as Pseudomonas syringae catalyze ice formation? Like all bacteria, Pseudomonas syringae has proteins in the outer membrane of its cell. One of these proteins has a special affinity for water. This ice nucleation protein binds water molecules, orients and organizes them near the surface of the bacterial cell. This makes the thermodynamic conditions more favorable for ice formation depending on the ambient temperature. This is a very rapid reaction, as you will see in this short film of Pseudomonas stringy inducing ice to form in water that has been cooled to minus 7 degrees Celsius. This water would have remained in a liquid state if we hadn't added the bacterial suspension. Main sources of biological ice nucleating particles in the environment are the microbial communities on plants. The outer surfaces of leaves, for example, are naturally colonized by bacteria and fungi in the same way that our skin has a natural microflora. Healthy, in fact, most of the known ice nucleation active microorganisms are found on plants, in leaf litter, or in soil. Furthermore, these different observations have led to the idea that ice nucleation active microorganisms are the key to a feedback cycle between land cover and the atmosphere. This feedback cycle has been called bioprecipitation. In this cycle, Microorganisms are lifted into the atmosphere, they incite rainfall through their ice nucleation activity, and are deposited back to the ground with rainfall. This is a critical question because land use is changing at unprecedented rates, 
with crops now accounting for at least 50% of vegetated surfaces and over 90% of managed land cover. If we consider the amounts of bacterial aerosols that are emitted from different types of land covers, it is clear that tree culture and other crops are responsible for the vast majority of microbial aerosols. Therefore, the choice of plant species and agronomic or forestry practices could have an important influence on the microorganisms on these plants. Furthermore, the geographic location of these plants could be important to assure that their microorganisms are released into the atmosphere in strategic contexts that have an impact on rainfall. It is clear that tree culture and other crops are responsible for the vast majority of microbial aerosols. Instead of, not seeing, instead of seeing your face, I see some mountains. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. I'm so on the hood. I'm not no. sure. I'm not sure about the total area, but I would say the location is critical. Mm -hmm. And if if you had the means, I would just like do a strip that's as wide as your mountain is wide, right up to the mountains. Because what's going to happen? And oh, but of course you have to study the movement of your air masses. Okay, what you would hope for is the formation of orographic clouds. Do you know what orographic clouds are? The yes. orographic clouds are the ones that form and they hang up on the mountains. Yes. So on one, there's a side of the mountain somewhere that that air in your place is going to come up. And so I would colonize that side of the mountain at the time, of course, that the, the flowering would be happening and the trees would be budding. So you're, maybe your air moves some different directions. You'd have to look at the, the, the behavior of your air masses. So it, I suppose in the spring and summer, when, when do you need rain? The summer, right? Yes. Yeah, so where is the, where are the air masses moving from and to in terms of those mountains? I would position it so you, it would be in the trajectory of those air masses, okay? And, um, and then uh, if you have a physicist there, well, I don't know what you can measure. It'd be really nice to, to capture things in the atmosphere so you could... There's ways to measure ice nuclei in the atmosphere, but you can measure water vapor. There are ways apparently with cell phones to measure water vapor in the atmosphere. And if you could show that you actually increase the, the vapor content in the air, that would already be an, an interesting indicator. Okay? Okay. But look, if there's a place where you have orographic clouds, I would need that GPS point, and I would actually do the backwards trajectories from there. Where is air coming from that goes there? during different seasons, just the map, just like the maps I made, just like the graphs I made for the place in New Mexico. Okay. I will try. Thank you. Robert Davies is famous for his um, temperature mitigation research, data research over the years. In 2016, he presented the differences between reforestation and geoengineered weather. And he basically said that he loved this. And he just wrote me this the other day. Dear Denise, congratulations on the success you're having with your food forest. Temperature moderation and low water use, just wonderful. He's the one that gives me the data as well as a lot of meteorologists. With respect to Utah temperatures, Utah as a whole is warming at about twice the global average for the last five decades. That's Rob Davies. that Denise would do work on is very much cultural. This regenerative um, 
approach to agriculture uh, and sustainable food systems. Which are absolutely a piece of the, of the equation, a big piece in taking us where we need to go. have been reduced to this. Hills and gullies were designated as ecological zones to be protected. Farmers were given financial compensation for not farming on them and keeping their livestock pinned up. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. Now when it rains, the water no longer runs straight off the slopes. Trapped by the vegetation, it sinks into the ground where it is retained in the soil, taking weeks and months to gently seep down and irrigate the fields and terraces below. Restoration has occurred over an area of 35,000 square kilometers. The impact of such an enormous addition of vegetation goes far beyond the plateau itself there's been a significant reduction in the soil rushing down into the Yellow River. As on the Luce Plateau, centuries of subsistence farming practices have stripped the land of natural vegetation. The dry gullies bear the scars of flash floods. These gullies are evidence of the enormous power of runoff during the rainy season. Without vegetation cover on the hillsides, when the rains come, the water doesn't soak into the ground but flows away in a flood. Then it's not available for agriculture during the rest of the year. This leads to drought, and famously for Ethiopia, famine. But just as I've witnessed in China, there is hope that the situation here can be reversed. Yeah. In just six years, Professor Legessa Nagash and local villagers have transformed a severely eroded terrain by planting indigenous trees and plants. Almost miraculously, a clear flowing stream has emerged where once there was a muddy trickle. How is it that it's possible for you to get the stream to flow throughout the year? It is because of the vegetation cover which has been regenerating on this mountain. This water is maintained in the landscape because as soon as rain falls on the canopy, on this vegetation, that rain then infiltrated gradually into the ground, ending up with this steady flow of this river. Water is life. Without water, nobody can do anything. I'm amazed, as short as five years, six years, you get clean water like this, provided you work hard for restoring this degraded landscape. Dr. Goodall, may I ask you, Ethiopia planted about 500 million trees. Rwanda has done the same thing, and they've seen reversal of climate change problems. The hydrology cycle comes back to normal. Have you seen some of this personally? Uh, well, I've seen that all around um, in the countries where our youth program operates. Yes. The young people are planting trees, and they're planting hundreds in Burundi and in Tanzania. This new program of planting, I think it's three trillion trees. Yes, evergreening. The yes. They just talked about it at yeah. the United yeah. Nations last week. Yeah, that's right. Yes, and you've seen the results, though. I've seen the results. It works, yeah, doesn't even it? In, in our little programs, we, yes. we have one water source 
where people used to go and drink water and it totally dried, dried out. out and then trees were planted and now the water's come back and people are drinking from it. Well, we're going to share that with the world. Thank you. The global water cycle of land and sea is a broad schematic of the water cycle. We can affect all parts of this cycle in adverse or beneficial ways. Evaporation, transpiration are the main elements that make up atmospheric water. 84% is evaporated off the sea. 16% is evaporated off surface storages and biological storages. 23% falls as precipitation and is intercepted by forest canopies surface storages and joins overland flows of streams and rivers. Some goes to soil storages, infiltration seepages and through flow springs. Infiltration seepage goes on to groundwater storages and interflows within subsoil as spring lines. Further still goes on to deep storage recharge, base flows of deep springs all help recharge stream flows at the surface. Transpire up into the atmosphere, so it has a profound effect, these forests, in actually cooling the climate. It is a fundamental change in the environment. Over half of the Earth's rainfall and clouds are driven biologically by precipitation nuclei produced by vegetation. Phil, in this place, in this grassland, where you see our very first office there on that hill, four years later, there's this one green blob on the Earth's surface. <laughs> after one year, and this is after two years. And that's green. So we lower the air temperature, three to five degrees Celsius. The air humidity is up 10%. Cloud cover, I'm going to show it to you. It's up, rainfall is up, and all these species and income. This almost wiped it out by becoming reliant on very extractive pumps, extracting the groundwater, diverting the river. To the extent that we actually killed our river, we dropped our groundwater table over 300 feet. And create a basin in the earth between the curb and sidewalk that can capture some of that water. And right next to that, we have uh, plants planted. Their base of the trees are high and dry, but their roots are soaking up that water. And here's what it, uh, that site looks like after about a year. So over that time, water's been coming in off the street, sinking into the ground, getting cleaned by the soil and the plant roots and the microbes. And those trees are growing and they're shading the sidewalk. They're beautifying the neighborhood. They're shading where you park your car. For about a decade or 15 years. This is not a mile and a half from here in the Dunbar Spring neighborhood at Brad Lancaster's house. This isn't the... Tucson Botanical Gardens, this is a sidewalk in a Tucson neighborhood. The city of Tucson's getting in on the game as well, uh, major innovators in this area. This is Scott Avenue, just a few blocks away. Cap the, both sides of the street have little curb cuts to feed uh, with stormwater street trees along both sides of the street. It's a beautiful sort of capstone downtown project. Check it out.
wonderful about this is this is to help boost your immune system. It's one of the plants that's amazing. And it's in the cone family, so they'll call it the purple cone flower, but there's also other cone flowers, including Mexican hats and other colors of cone flowers. One thing, along with our grapevines, we try to train to go behind is our fig tree here. That's three years old now and loaded with beautiful figs. So people think that these can't grow in winter in Utah, but these come from the Italian Alps. So that's why this is one that has really grown well here under our beautiful black mulberry. This is the youngest black mulberry tree we have here. And we have a white mulberry as well. Underneath, we plant all sorts of little plants. We've got beautiful borage right here. We've got calendulas coming up. We have a gorgeous ground cover of sweet potato, little strawberries, and then what we call our living mulch carpet of beautiful flat cake. It's just gorgeous little flat, which is great for us to eat, but it also feeds nitrogen to the microbes into the soil, but then turn around and feed your plants more nutrient-dense food. This is what we call our zone one kitchen garden. And the kitchen garden catches water off the roof when there's rain, and it comes down on contour and winds like a snake through here on contour. And that's where the water would flow, or you could actually put your, your irrigation through level, winding through this kitchen garden. The ground was covered with 12 inches of wood chips, through the most amazing soil full of fungi, you saw little mushrooms when it rains. We use that good soil to build the bed. These are just uh, ground level beds right here. And the soil that's growing in here is so amazing, full of everything alive. So when you dig down into this beautiful, rich, flat gold, you've got worms, you've got all sorts of beautiful living things in here. Look at the baby potatoes. Isn't that fun? Did you see? This was sandy soil. Now you've got gorgeous living soil with life in it. That's what you want to raise in your garden. You want to raise soil. You're not just growing vegetables. You're growing soil. Living soil like a floor. Seeing a floor. And all those microbes are what are the microbiota for the plant. We have them in our digestive tract. They have their digestive tract in the soil. And that's the only way the plant can be fed fertilizer from these beautiful microbes in the soil. So we have our canopy tree, which is picked specifically not only to create filtered light and shade this whole kitchen garden zone one, but he's also white willow bark, which is the inner bark, which makes aspirin from. So he's a pain reliever. His branches, when you put them in water, actually create growth hormone to help other plants grow. So he has so many great values. And then this is six years old. He was just a little tree at the nursery. In six years, he grew this fast. So he's got a lot of value, this amazing white willow tree. So that's why we picked him in our design as our canopy tree. Here we have another cover crop, which is a buckwheat. And you know you can eat that for cereal in the morning, but make sure you sprout it or ferment it or soak it before you ever eat grains like that because of the coating around them. Um, he's got beautiful tomatoes right there. You can see a little tomato that's ripening in this bed. We've got peppers also in this bed that are about to flower. And then he's got these beautiful sun chokes that I kind of invented because in Utah it's so hot and dry. But when all these little plants were young, and I'm not talking annuals, even the little perennial berry bushes and trees, there was no shade and it's so hot in the summer sun, 100 degrees, that I had to come up with temporary shade. I first tried sunflowers because I love the bees and the birds that come with sunflowers, but they weren't as easy to manage. Then I saw these Jerusalem artichokes, or sun chokes, they're also called, and they grow straight up. They're great stalks for the plants to grow up, because tomatoes are vines, but they're also great shade, and they're the best tuber food, like potatoes, and you can eat all winter long, dig them out in the winter. They don't freeze. So you can literally use these as shade. And they'll have beautiful yellow flowers in the fall on top, just one flower, but we use them as growing shade. That's what this is. Quick growing shade. I never heard of anybody doing that. Just grapevines growing over in the desert, but I decided I want to have shade here in Utah. These are Niagara white grapes. They make a beautiful pink grape juice after the first freeze. We'll harvest them and make a natural juice. We'll only add a little bit of our honey from our hive here, and that'll make beautiful juice. Along here, blackberries, raspberries, 
We have a native to Utah heirloom treat. This is called a Patalonic plum. Sometimes they've named it American plum, but when the Native Americans introduced this to the settlers, the pioneers in Utah, they found out about this heirloom Patalonic plum. We can't wait till these ripen so we can taste our first Patalonic plum here, which is really wonderful. Because of the vegetation in this ecosystem that you've created, because of the trees and the plants, the cover crop, ground cover, everything, you're getting such a wet coolness in here that things like tropical Polynesian taro root, turmeric, beautiful leaves, okay, ginger grows in this. You can grow all these beautiful little plants, calendula, valerian, lemon basil. Everybody's happy. And here's another little carpet of cover crop of flax right here. And behind me, we've got buckwheat. Our lettuce now is going to flower, so it's bolting. But We've got beautiful sweet potatoes are coming up, and tomatoes are about to ripen. So that all these beautiful plants in here are loving the coolness that we have with our wonderful spearmint right here. All these plants are loving this filtered light in here because they don't bake in the hot sun. They don't need as much water, and the cover crops are holding the moisture in the ground so it doesn't evaporate. And so it feels wonderful in here. It's like a little rainforest effect. We're creating a microclimate. And instead of rows of organic monoculture, that people are just growing vegetables in rows, I'd rather do this. My vegetables grow beautifully, my greens, everything. My herbs grow beautifully in here. Berry bushes grow well. And look at all the red catawba grapes straight up. Look at all those up there. Isn't that just amazing? All this food is all growing in layers of a forest in here. And they're all so happy. Aren't they beautiful? It's really wonderful to see what nature will naturally do. And so that's what we do in permaculture. We're letting nature do what it does best instead of controlling it. We learn from it and we work with it. And then we can see all the benefits, all these plants and all these insects and all the microbes and all the birds and the snakes and you name it, all of wildlife is in here and they're all balancing out together. They all know what they're supposed to do. So everything works great together here. You don't have problems like pesticides and diseases and all these other problems or overabundance of anybody. Everything is balancing out because it's natural. It's a natural ecosystem that's happening here if you let all the plants do what they want to do. So under here, you'll see lots of beautiful plants that will grow in this filtered light, that charred like sorrel. We've got sorrels all through here. Little pepper here about to flower. Lettuce is on its way out, but we try to save as much as we can. And so in here you see all these different little plants with this lovely flax little carpet of mulch. It's what we call our living mulch. And they're under the filtered light of these trees and they're being hidden by my quick growing shade of sun chokes hiding the west sun at the end of the afternoon that would be so hot baking on these little plants. And so we can grow a lot of greens all through the summer, which everyone else really has a hard time. They're all just going to flower right now. But it's just a beautiful carpet with sweet potatoes there, kale there. Over here, you've got more greens, sweet potato. That will feed the tree the minerals that it needs to grow healthy and strong. And then here's our little thermostat. Outside, it was 98 degrees and it's 79 in here. There's a huge difference in temperature. There really is. This is what you're creating. You're keeping moisture. So you're able to grow things that normally wouldn't grow, like you saw that taro root. And everything is just lush and healthy and delicious. And then what we do is what's called a spectrometer. You do a test on nutrient density by the sweetness of the fruit. So when we test these, they test twice as much, twice as high as what you would get even organically grown. So we're a tomato was a nine in our food forest, it was a 14. So there's a huge difference when you're growing like nature like this. And then you've got herbs growing in here. So I've got dill, this is lemon verbena. That's so beautiful and smells so delicious. Just a little bit of everything. We've got tomatillos growing over there. They have the blue yellow flowers. 
just a little bit of everything with a beautiful living mulch carpet under it. So now we're going to take you, this is zone one, we're going to go into zone two on food forks. This is a sumac that the Native Americans use being sumac berries. This is called a smooth sumac. So it grows lower and it's growing beautifully all across here. And that's one of the 35 berries we have here. A native one that we bought from the Native Utah Association Nursery, the Reclamation Nursery, that helps us get a lot of native berry bushes and other plants. Something amazing in berries when they're drying like this. That's when they have all the sweet ones and then spit out all the seeds back in the ground. So this is when they have all that sweetness. So when you taste one of these, oh, they're so delicious. What's great, this is the second most nutritious berry in those food forests. The first one is a seed buckthorn. But this one has protein, lycopene, vitamins, minerals. This is high nutrient density. This is a great one that you just want to eat or make syrup of because it's going to give you all those nutrients to boost your immune system, make it strong. Beautiful. It's a hookah bed with logs in the ground, and it's amazing. You've got cover crop of buckwheat here. These are the actual seeds of the buckwheat that you can start harvesting right now. So that is beautiful little seed right there from buckwheat. It's a wonderful ground cover. And then you've got another ground cover. This is a cover crop of sweet potatoes, You've got beautiful beans in here that are literally, watch, climbing, climbing, climbing all the way up as hard as it can go. That's what beans like to do. You've got the quick orange shade on the south side of my sunchokes right there. You've got gorgeous nurstation flowers right here, which are edible and very spicy. These beautiful, beautiful flowers and these beautiful leaves of nurstation. So I love them throughout the garden. And then you've got a Padawanic plum right here and i know he had a little plum there he is he's got a few little plums on him though he's only two years old right here he's got little baby Padawanic plums behind him is a buffalo berry another native to utah he'll have little tiny red little berries this is an heirloom to our neighborhood of 40 years plus um, peach tree right there and that's what we love to grow and then up here let's pan we have our wonderful white mulberry was loaded with white that turned lilac. Mulberries all over this guy. If you look up at the sky, look at all this. It was all loaded with mulberries. So you've got some blueberries right here. Behind a golden current and under, look at this gorgeous sky. This is called a black locust. And he grew from a little stick, 12 inches tall, so skinny it's been my finger into this in six years. Isn't he beautiful? He does a great canopy cover as well that help the plants do really well. And then under here, where we have our nursery right there, there's our beehive. Our little busy bees are making so much honey. The two largest deep boxes on there are full of honey. They're like 100 pounds. So we've got these beautiful elderberries. These aren't ripe yet. We're going to make elderberry syrup this winter. And you'll see the ones that are ripe under the netting over there so we get to save them. Otherwise, the birds would love to eat them all. And we're going under our six foot plus tall fennel bush. Look at the size of this beautiful fennel. Isn't he gorgeous? We have to support him because he gets so heavy. He's going to fall over. But when you smell the licorice smell of this, these are all seeds of fennel right there. And he's so potent because of the nutrient density we're getting. So this is our Bing cherry tree. He was loaded all the way up those tall branches. So if you want to pick cherries, and there's a cherry picker there, and you don't want to have to climb trees, you need to thin them out and march prune them back down lower because that's what they do. But you see how we've created this amazing shade with all the mints growing and other plants underneath? All the grapevines are growing, and look at all those grapes hanging from him right there, as well as right there. It's just beautiful to see. And then underneath, because it's growing nice and cool, we have these beautiful little called snowberries. Normally, they came out and produced berries in December, but we started flowering again this summer, and there's little snowberries. It's so beautiful to see. And there's a little whorehound that normally only grows in the desert. We used to make candy out of whorehounds like this. 
really soft, pretty plant. They come back every year right there. And then behind you, more sumac. This is a honey locust volunteer right there coming up. Catnip all through here. Alfalfa. We have on both sides these little pods that are the seeds of the daikon radish. But when they're tender and green, you eat them instead of the radish and they're really pungent. But here are the little seed pods, so it reseeds itself every year with these little tiny, tiny seeds. And so we just let them drop to the ground, but you can harvest lots of seeds yourself. We have two little berries. One is tiny over there called the juvi berry, and here's a gumi berry. And a little Japanese lady came to tour this morning. She says, I know the juvi berry. They're wonderful. She was so excited to actually see one here. Because everything grows so big and beautiful here, what normally the size of a black currant is this. That's as big as a black currant gets, we think. Well, not in this garden. Since the second year, every year, our black currants have grown to this size. You look at this size. That's really big and beautiful. Gorgeous black currants. Look at this one. Look at the size of that one. See? Everything grows huge in this garden because of all the natural things that are acquiring. So everything grows big and beautiful. It's really wonderful. Look at the size of this gorgeous country. Although we've chopped and dropped it and taken all the leaves that's each of this don't you care above it. This is how big it grows back over and over again. It comes back this big and strong with the hugest leaves. You see these humongous leaves of comfrey full of minerals. And we feed that to this Danju pear tree right here. All these beautiful comfreys. This is another almond tree. This is all in one sweet almond. He's just starting to open right now, right here. But look at the size of these almonds behind the beautiful pond where, because we have moisture under here, we like to put near one of the cute little garter snake in there. We like to put all the yarrow and the kinds of plants that like the cool moisture in here. And they do really well. Over here, you've got another nurse of a really beautiful color right here. When you look at this gorgeous yellow, they come in all different colors, reds, oranges, yellows. This beautiful nurse It's just so gorgeous. We have our sage. And we have our beautiful mints all along the edges of our beds and all along the edge of the garden. These gorgeous, these little, look like pipe cleaners, are the little flowers that will turn into seeds. But what happens is when you've got all these flowers, you also have a million bees of all different sizes and shapes. You see the tiniest, tiniest one flying around? That's a medium. There's miniature little tiniest ones in here. They're so beautiful to see so many sizes, shapes, and colors of bees. They love these mint flowers every year at this time. On the other side of the plum tree, we have this gorgeous, this is, remember the red dock? This is the yellow dock, or curly dock. It's full of minerals. So what happens, people complain, oh, the bugs and the birds and everything are eating all my plants. What do I do with the slugs and the snails and all that? I'm like, give them something good to eat, and then they won't bother your silly vegetable. So high in minerals, grasshoppers, slugs, but if you don't water at night, they won't come out of the ground. So let them eat and munch on all this stuff, because I've got millions of these leaves. So here's a little sweetness here. That is a wild, delicious blackberry. That's what we're going to taste, okay? That has so much sweetness. Mm. So when they start to dry out a little bit, too, they're going to be sweet. So let's try a couple here. They're starting to get sweet. Moshe, you want to try? Okay, let's try. This one's going to be the sweetest ones, these little ones here, because they are drying. So that's when all the sugar comes in. When they're shiny like this, they're not as sweet. Taste that. Weren't the first ones really sweet? Now taste that one. Not as sweet. Really I know. Cool. I'm very picky in here. I'll see a fungi doing their decomposing work under the ground, right? In the living soil. This is their flower. 
that little mushroom because you have moisture in here. That's their flowers right there. And isn't it beautiful, a little carpet of cover crop right there, keeping the moisture in from evaporating? It's just so amazing what you can create when you know what you're doing with nature. Just let it do what it was programmed to do. And under here we have a row. All these are our gooseberry row, but they've already ripened and disappeared. Sorry, you guys. But we have all these gooseberries along here, and they like the coolness in here of the shade. They really love that. So these are all little gooseberries. They look like little green see-through Chinese lanterns, but you wait until they have little thorns, so watch out. You wait until they turn bright purple and they're ready to fall off the vine. They're very high in vitamin C. A lot of the berries are really full of vitamin C. We've got our beautiful golden raspberries spreading out everywhere. These are all golden raspberry plants. They've already produced their first crop. So now we're going to get the second crop. The new growth is coming in, and we'll get a second batch of golden raspberries. So you can see they're starting to produce right here. We're here with a hardy kiwi growing up the trellis. There's our beautiful red cornelian cherries right there. Aren't they gorgeous? They're the most beautiful color that you've ever seen in your life. Look at those gorgeous red cornelian cherries right there. That's just something you don't see every day. Most people are like, I've never even heard of it. <laughs> what are you talking about? Hmm. There's 35 kinds of berries in this food forest. I'm getting my omega-7s right now on these beautiful... 190 different component little berries called sea buckthorn berries. They are beauties. This is our third year in a row. And this is the teenager. No, this is the teenager here. You look all the way up and it's got all those berries up there. This is the mother that's growing inside the peach tree. If we can create an ecosystem like this, it sequesters the carbon and the pollution. It cools the planet down. 20 degrees as we've proven. It also will help the hydrology cycle so we're not flood, drought, flood, drought. It helps all the climate problems, the erosion, the lack of resources like water and other things. What we're doing is we're letting nature do the work. So this six year example of a food forest Our next presenter is Denise Devnick. She's the founder and director of the Permaculture Design School at the PDC Permaculture Institute. She has eight years of experience designing and implementing water catchment passive desert on contour, or water catchment passive desert on contour flowing into the infiltration basins, swells, hugel beds, rainwater harvesting, gravity flows, stormwater, and gray water use. Um, we are catching really good. So it's going over the sidewalk, running down, and going inside the pipe right there, and then over to the other end of the pipe, and it's coming out perfectly right there. You see the water. So it does work, you guys. Good job, Joshua. There it is, you guys. We have water from the roof all the way to the top of the garden. Woohoo! It works, Joshua. Wow. Wasn't that beautiful, you guys? We shouldn't be wasting what precious drinking water we have when we're in moderate to severe drought in Utah right now. Keep this under. Look at that water. 
basement from there and down in the infiltration basin. So we'll have to see how well they drain. Look at that. We're getting so much water is going right over the spillways and right down into the next ones. That's pretty amazing, guys. That's how infiltration basins work. Catches there, comes down, elbows, and then all level through here. Same thing on this side, comes down, and then up here, and goes up. So this is a current student with 100 acres in Arizona that lives in Centerville, but they'll be moving down. We are doing catchment ponds off the hillside. They get their rain in the summer. And we've put in 500 plants of native hardy um, drought resistant in two sections of zone one around. This is where they'll be living. Greenhouse, solar, and um, this is another part of zone one that we've put in native uh, trees. 450 trees and shrubs have been put in to his property so far. We use the water swales. We helped him like I did here eight years ago, contact Arizona State University, find out about native plants. And with our database, we knew a lot of the plants that would help to design where they should go depending on sectors. This was Becky's 40 acres on the Severe River by Scipio, and she killed 450 trees in six years. And then she came here and said, help, I don't want to kill any more plants and trees. So we helped her design this. And at our permit blitz last year, we put these different um, guilds in and water systems. Those are our current and past students that come every year to our permit blitzes where we have someone, I call it garden barn raising, Put in a garden in a day. This is not the 40 acres, just the zone one. And we had to use different techniques because of the wind. Also cattle from neighbors that come and eat everything. And then two months later, she was so happy to see how green and lush. We use sunflowers as what I call quick growing shade, cover crops as the little perennial trees and berry bushes and canopy trees start to grow. Bluffdale, an acre and a half. You can see all these on our YouTube channel, Utah Valley Permaculture. We include lots of youth groups. This was an eagle project, and they dug the hookle bed by hand. Here's just a few of our other students' designs over the last seven years. This is a simple backyard that Bob designed with water catching off his roof. He'd like to get it off the street and then his guilds that he put in. This is the Oldham Seven Acres in Benjamin, Utah. They would like to have a store to sell all the varieties of berries. They get to practice in our classroom um, experimental garden here. They learn how to put in basins. They learn how to um, use mulch and how to strategically um, move water through the property. They practice and they all come with their kids, which is so much fun. I love teaching the kids. So we've researched um, and planted over a hundred native trees in this food forest and plants and everything. We prefer perennials. I'm tired of watering vegetables. My perennials are doing so well, as you'll see in a second on the virtual tour, but I have 3,500 plants that I would like to find out A to Z, all the characteristics of these plants, the benefits, everything it is gonna do. This is pond after pond after pond after pond, maximizing the amount of water stored in this valley. It's getting dry here in Western Oregon. You can see the difference in color demonstrating the rehydration of this landscape. So there is a bowl that is feeding this system. So we've got a ridge, we've got a ridge, we've got a valley in between. So the water from this watershed, it comes down and it is intercepted by the roadways, channeling the surface runoff and the water that falls on the road surface itself, 
into these ponds. So we've got this accumulation of water storage capacity by these multiple cascading ponds. And then at the bottom, the largest pond here, the water's collected and they actually are now recirculating the water, pumping the water back up to the top of the system. These are unlined ponds. So water is seeping down into the water table. So it's like creating this water battery. There's trees planted around that are all gonna grow up and become a forest all around here. And then there's water recharging into the aquifer. Hi, I'm Brenda Smolofoti, and we're here in Carleton, Oregon. I'm standing in a really beautiful valley that we call Shangri-La on our property called The Ground. I'm the manager of Tabia Rasa Farms and the founder, and this is one of the pieces of water retention permaculture that we installed almost three years ago. And as you can see, the trees are growing in, the water plants are filling around the ponds, and we get to enjoy this every day. So where we're standing was a stock grazing farm that just got grazed and grazed and grazed and never got any relief. And a lot of runoff happening, just going nowhere. Through scarcity, you start to innovate, right? And I started doing my research and eventually found Zachary Weiss. My friend and colleague, Zach Weiss of Water Stories, which is a community teaching and inspiring people all around the world how to restore water cycles, came here off and on for six years, building this really extensive series of ponds covering multiple different properties. The way these water bodies are built they're really to recharge the water back into the earth and into the sides. And so we get this constant greenery, this vegetation, carbon sequestration, cooling, growth, and productivity. We started with water because the original piece of my farm had no water. I had two neighbors on each side of me that had good wells and I had no underground water that was accessible. Just through that experience, I decided there had to be other ways to find resiliency with water. Whereas there was no water on this landscape in the dry times, now we have serious recharge year round. You know, it's basically like putting money in the bank, putting water back into the bank. So when we were mapping these ponds out, it was a real challenge on how we were going to move water in such steep grade changes. In between each of the water bodies is a rock armored spillway. And in that rock and gravel all around that surface with flowing water live the microorganisms that filter and clean the water. So in between each of the water bodies, there's this biofilter. So in this part of the design of Shangri-La, we call this our aquaculture pond. It's a shallower pond full of native water plants, tadpoles, dragonflies, frogs, birds, you name it. I've seen geese here, ducks here, a blue heron likes to visit occasionally. So it's a really special place. So I'm standing on one of our docks. It's about creating beauty, but also is utilitarian in that we can come here and monitor our monk. It's a device that allows us to regulate how much water we keep in the pond. So this is one of my favorite ponds. We call it Woods Pond. There was already a natural little basin here that we expanded. There's a lot of water that comes down from the hills. This is spring fed. Woods Pond is the pond that supplies the rest of the system at Shangri-La through the terrace and ditch system. Everything is utilitarian. So what we're walking on looks like a simple road. It's actually probably one of the coolest features of our Shangri-La water system. There's a ridge between this valley and the next valley over. The forest pond is collecting water flowing through its watershed, but then a roadway has been established between these two valleys around the ridge at a very, very slight drop, at a one in 100 drop. So when that pond in that basin fills up, it overflows, it doesn't overflow down into the watershed, into this valley below. The water comes at a very subtle drop across the landscape around this ridge and deposits into this system. And so this is nearly doubling our catchment area, but it's also really keeping that water on the landscape for even longer. Andrew, this road was really an engineering feat. We made it within one inch to make the gravity fall work. Yeah. So you, you only had one inch, one inch of to spare. One inch to spare. Right. Like from the fall to make it actually work. Wow. Yeah. So the water is being kept at this level point in the landscape. It's being kept at its highest elevational point that it can be kept 
yet move to this larger storage area. When you marry the access way, the road placement, and the water flow into a single system, it has this huge effect on the overall hydrology of these two basins, and it is executed beautifully. We've invested a lot here in water systems, ponds, and ways to slow the flow of water and let more water impregnate in the soil, which helps change dew point, cool temperatures, even if slightly, and increase the diversity of the life that passes through this place. From a farmer's perspective, conventional agriculture has always been putting their water resources on top of the ground. Permaculture really flips that around. We like to do it from the bottom up. So using permaculture water retention philosophies, you're putting water back in the ground. And then through that, it's these tiny veins and arteries, if you think about it that way, seep back up into the land, putting pressure on the springs that are already there and therefore creating actually more water that's accessible through the springs. This spring would add about maybe three gallons a minute when we tapped it is now at the height of the season, 10 to 15 gallons a minute. The water is definitely seeping through the ground, being filtered and refined and put back into the creek. And that's affecting all of our neighbors. There's this common misconception that these features steal water from downstream. They actually provide more water to downstream over time. These laws that are meant to stop developments from draining wetlands, I feel are being misapplied to people who are trying to heal and restore landscapes and waterways. So it turns out we got into a little bit of trouble. Someone reported activity, pond building on this piece of land, and suddenly we were talking to the Department of State Lands here in Oregon. So there's a kind of wild thing about this whole project is they didn't get any permits or any permission to do this. So now they're in this whole situation where They've had to spend a lot of time and a lot of resources to interface with these government agencies in order to retroactively permit these structures. Many people from the agencies that came here, I think were in awe of what we did, except it doesn't fit in that legal box. And their job is to make sure that things fit in the legal box. So I, I totally understand that. Lots of rules and regulations are created to try to make things fair, try to keep in integrity to the environment, either negotiating through or fighting through some laws or regulations that are maybe not best for the way the planet works, is part of the dialogue of change and part of the dialogue of diversity and discussion and debate. And you find yourself on the opposite side of the table with people who have the exact same intent as you. We've lost so much of our wetland, we need to make it really easy for people who want to create wetlands. Instead of putting a wall of red tape around working in these areas, we need to recognize that we can have a positive impact. And in fact, if we want to balance out all of the disturbances we see today, we need to have one. I've got to say, you can't blame regulators for having a pretty intensive permitting process to create water bodies because the potential to do really damaging things is very high. I mean, what are a lot of people doing out there? They are pumping water out of water bodies, out of creeks, out of streams, putting them into storages, and then spraying them over the landscape for irrigation. But in this case, in my opinion, hydrologically, this is a benefit. This is a benefit to the ecosystem. This is a benefit to the water table. This is a benefit to the overall ecology. I think that this is a good thing. And after a lengthy dialogue, they were able to demonstrate that to the regulators. The whole water system is now legally permitted. After the first year of installing the storage basins, I was already getting longer rotations of cattle. With the earth staying greener longer, you get more rotations. They're doing what they need to do to fertilize the land. So it's this great systematic effect. It's not just altruistic. They are increasing the available water on their pasture lands, which is creating greater productivity in their animal herds, which leads to an increase in income. There's definitely very tangible financial benefits to farmers for adopting some of these practices in their landscapes.
Some of the things we've done at the ground are longer than a 100-year return on invested capital. You do that if you know that what you're building is in part larger than yourself. You also would have certain parts of your enterprise that need to make a return on invested capital that's sane in today's world and also allows you to have a functioning business. As if the water system wasn't enough, coming here, I found wonderful hospitality. The farm, there's the farm store. They took us out to dinner at their restaurant and it was super good. Farm to table, local food. I'm pretty sure that we ate the carrots that we saw the farmers harvesting that day. They put us up in their brand new inn, sitting here overlooking the whole pond system. They have been so hospitable and kind. Putting together the food, the farm, the joy of humans and connecting, it's heaven on earth. So all of these storage basins have a function, but for me, you know, it's really about the beauty, creating beauty in the environment for animals, plants, people to enjoy. That's, that's what does it for me. If everyone was doing this kind of work, this kind of permaculture work to put water back in the ground, I think we'd see a much greener planet be a huge impact for generations to come. Are you ready to transform deserts, create lush backyards and feed communities? In my almost 30 years as a permaculture designer traveling the world, I've put everything I learned into Oregon State University's online permaculture design course, or PDC. The PDC and PDC Pro are the ultimate way to begin mastering permaculture. Me and my team guide you through over 20 assignments with more than 100 hours of top quality video lectures and resources all focused on developing your own property or project throughout the course. You'll get personalized feedback from a dedicated instructor in a small group setting. People are always asking me, how can I be part of the solution? This is your starting point. Check the link below for upcoming courses and join us in creating a better world for everyone. See you in class. You have to remind yourself that these people. That's Sandra Millison. Other ones, that's in the Middle East. Bill Millison, our father of permaculture, warned in the 70s that deforestation over farming would create uh, climate change. Are we at the crossroads now to make these decisions, or oh, we have been for several years? I think it was pretty cool. 20 years ago, and I think now they were pretty cool. This is in your Sonoma Desert, you guys, down there in Arizona. you got to go visit this for me. I would love to see this in person. That vast areas of America, this is part of the great dust bowl of the 1930s, when most of the soil grew away. The 2 million and 30 million and 35 came from Roosevelt and the 2 million American death. Civilized means needed to repair and alert. People have come to work to repair the damage. They built hundreds of miles of earth banks to show up the runoff water, long enough to settle out the silt behind them and for some water to save into the ground. And this is called swag. Mm -hmm. 20 years later, Jeff Lawton made this amazing movie of it. The Sonoran Desert. I'm in the flat bottom land here, kind of a penny plain in the Sonoran Desert. And it's not much fertility around. Pretty sparse vegetation actually. And this here is an 80 year old swell bank put in in the Great Depression in the Roosevelt era. That's a big one. That's how it walked over the top. Then you see this obvious event that starts to happen. The trees get green and big, and the vegetation gets really lush. And this is something you need to really understand. It's not if we go, but you see a scene like this, an oasis of 
lush verde and green, created by nature, facilitated by good design. This is a very special scene. No maintenance, any years of fertility accumulated by water. Design to infiltrate into this paradise cave. 